cancer is the third leading cause of death in Kenya after infectious diseases and cardiovascular diseases. In men, prostate cancer is the leading form of cancer, closely followed by cancer of the esophagus. A majority of these cancer cases, about 70 to 80 percent, are reported or diagnosed late, despite the Kenya Demographic and Health Survey reporting that 78 percent, a good majority of the people, are aware of the disease. Is it an issue of access to screening services, or is it an issue of the disparity that exists between men living in urban settings as opposed to those living in the rural settings where access to health services is still a challenge? On this second episode of the, second of the series on men's health, we discuss prostate cancer. This is Health Digest, your authoritative health show, with me, Dr. Masi Korir. And we start this discussion uh, with a short story by Mary Mwoki, who interviewed a man who, in his sunset years, when he was supposed to be in his retirement, he was spending his life savings treating prostate cancer, which was diagnosed five years ago. Let's watch the story. His measured steps speak of the journey he's walked for five years. The first telltale sign of the prostate cancer was his decreased libido. Although this worried him, he thought it was just an issue of age. But soon his urine patterns also changed. His bathroom trips significantly increased, prompting him to see a doctor. The results were unexpected. When I learned from the urologist that I uh, had a... Uh, advanced prostate cancer and I need immediate attention. Uh, uh, I had a big shock. Uh, it, uh, it rang a bell that life is important. I was just seeing death any time. And I collected myself when money was available and started a treatment. Vincent would go through 35 rounds of radiotherapy that took a toll on his health. Once a strong man with a solid body build, he could no longer walk without aid. He says that the cost of seeking treatment for his condition further crippled him. Generally, uh, I've improved greatly. The 76-year-old laments that he has had to spend all his life savings on treatment and it is never ending. 800,000 was just the original estimate. I've spent over two million. And I'm still spending almost four, 450 shillings daily on tablet. It is a serious matter. People are dying. Although his condition is incurable, Ayala says it's now under control. He advises people to go for regular screenings to save them the high burden of treatment costs. Go for early diagnosis so that the treatment can be short and cheap. The government should make it compulsory. that everybody should be screened, screened yearly. This will save the government a lot of revenue. And will save a lot of life. Prostate cancer may develop silently. Many men live in for many years without any symptoms. Researchers do not know exactly what causes prostate cancer, but they have found some risk factors, including changes in the DNA of a normal prostate cell, age, and family history. If diagnosed early enough and caught in the early stages, prostate cancer can be treated. Doctors therefore advocate for frequent screening, especially for men of 55 years of age and above. Mary Mwoki, KTN News for Health Digest. That story by Mary Mwoki starts this discussion on cancer of the prostate and we've seen the cost of cancer the screening possibilities and why 
as you heard Ayalo said, it's important for early screening. And for this discussion, I'm joined by uh, Dr. David Kimani to my immediate right, who is a urologist, and Dr. Andrew Diambo, who is a medical oncologist, just to delve into these issues of uh, prostate cancer. And I'd just like to get your comments. We've had Ayalo and we've had many Kenyans, and I'm sure in your practice you come across many Kenyans who cry about the cost of managing um, cancer. Is there a solution to this? Seeing Ayalo has spent almost two million shillings mm -hmm. up to now and is still on treatment. One thing that we notice is cancer is a pretty common condition. Prostate cancer especially is like you collectively observe is the number one uh, leading cancer in men. Uh, and uh, of importance is that it can be diagnosed early, and when diagnosed early, it's curative, as opposed to when you diagnose it a little bit late, when the management strategies move from cure to palliation. Yes, it can be an expensive uh, diagnosis, bearing in mind that you have to look at the diagnosis, the blood tests that are done, the biopsies that are done, the staging investigations that are done, where you have to go through CT scans, MRIs, PET scanning, like, like has uh, recently come into town. And then there is the issues of treatment, be it surgical, be it radiotherapy, be it uh, chemotherapy, and uh, supportive treatments like physiotherapy and the others. Now, as so far as the cost is concerned, the, the main issues are and, and we're happy the government has embarked a little bit more on diagnostics because currently we have virtually a CT scan in almost any major uh, town in Kenya. And uh, PSA is available as a test in all government uh, level four onwards hospitals. We are trying to make it available in level three. When it comes to treatment, that is where the, the bottlenecks are because radiotherapy outside Kenyatta National Hospital is not available in any other uh, government public hospital. Uh, currently, there are attempts at uh, installing these facilities in very many private hospitals. It's available at Nairobi, the Texas Cancer Center, MP Shah, Aga Khan Hospital. They are offering it. Medical oncology is coming in as a big way of managing prostate uh, cancer, and we have many urologists, uh, many uh, medical oncologists on training for 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 oncology. Uh, the one area that probably we are lagging behind is the training of surgeons. We are still pretty few who are able to treat prostate cancer surgically. It is an intensive procedure and uh, an expensive one. We are also glad that through private initiatives, hospitals like the Aga Khan are now brought the PET scan, okay. which would have made a patient with prostate cancer travel outside the country. What I'm proud to tell Kenyans is that there is no reason whatsoever for a patient in Kenya to travel to outside this country for treatment of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. The care they'll get here is like any other care anywhere okay. in the world. And I'd, I'd like to bring in Dr. Odiambo, you've mentioned medical oncologist and mm -hmm. he is one of them. What is your role, Dr. in managing prostate cancer? As a medical oncologist, we unfortunately come in towards the tail end of the disease. Uh, when patients fortunately or unfortunately cannot be cured and therefore they have to be on life prolonging treatment which they have to take almost indefinitely and these are some of the treatments we've seen on, on the clip that probably the patient is taking and has to pay <coughs> you know about 50 60 dollars every every month for treatment um, just as recent as not more than seven eight years some of these treatments were not there and patients' uh, lifespan was actually shorter. So these newer treatments have come, and we actually have them in the country. They are indeed costly, but I think the more we keep uh, using them, you know, the more we keep prescribing them, they are going to become cheaper. I, I would wish, or I would, if it was up to me, I would, I would task the government and, and ask them, why can we not, you know, make our own drugs? Because that really cuts down the cost of treatment. If really all you have to do is take some tablets and go and see the doctor four times a year, um, um, if our cost of drugs could come lower, if, if tax on, on cancer drugs and cancer equipment and all cancer-related you know, uh, equipment and tests and so on can come down, it will, re it will really impact on, on the patient. I'd also like to comment something small about NHIF and its uh, recent role in 
in alleviating the, the financial burden for cancer patients. It's really helping a lot of patients to access treatment, which they would otherwise have never afforded. And these treatments, especially for prostate cancer, are now scientifically proven to extend somebody's lifespan quite significantly. Okay. So coming uh, specifically to prostate cancer, and I'll start with you, Dr. Kimani. What are the signs that one should look out for or watch out for either in their man or in themselves if they are men uh, to signs that can hint that this is possibly prostate cancer so that people don't have to wait until they are diagnosed late? The most important can uh, symptom is that there is no symptom. Majority of <laughs> patients with prostate cancer, especially early prostate cancer, are completely asymptomatic. Let us remember that one in six men, if you live long enough, you develop prostate cancer. But out of this one in six men, only 3% will die of prostate cancer, meaning majority of the patients will die with their cancer, not of their cancer. That said then, how do we identify this patient who may be having cancer and is asymptomatic? That is where the issue of screening comes in. Mm -hmm. So you may not have any symptoms, and yet you have advanced prostate cancer. That said, there are symptoms that may manifest later in life. For example, because the prostate is a gland that, where the urethra passes through, any enlargement in that prostate will cause a narrowing on that path. And when you have a narrowing on that path, then you develop pro symptoms we call lower urinary tract symptoms. You may feel that you are passing urine a little bit more often. The stream is weak. You used to get a meter of a stream. Now the, the stream is almost coming to your, to, your, to your legs. You may find that you're not emptying your bladder completely. You have to wake up at night two or three times. The urine may be bloody or it may not be bloody. And uh, when the cancer has spread now to the other organs, you may notice that you may have uh, pain in the back, for example, if, it, if the cancer spreads the bones. You may have swelling of the legs if the lymph nodes are involved. You may have noted that you are losing weight over, over, over time. And if it is within the other organs, like the liver, the lungs, you may end up coughing. For example, if it's in the lung, you may end up with the headaches if they are, it has spread to the brain. But Importantly, is that these symptoms come in at the very rare end of the of the of the disease spectrum, and majority will be asymptomatic. Okay, and one of the questions that I get more often is that what causes cancer? And I'd like to ask Dr. Odiambo, what specifically causes prostate cancer, if at all there's any? Many Kenyans, most of my patients will ask me, and where did this cancer come from? I haven't smoked, I haven't taken alcohol, I haven't done all those things, bad things people say they do to get cancer. And there's no single specific cause for most cancers, apart from the ones that we know, we have studied them like cervical cancer and HPV. So there's no single one cause that you could say this is what led to me developing prostate cancer. We talk about risk factors, and these risk factors, the more they accumulate in a single individual, they have a higher likelihood of then developing the prostate cancer. And having said that, presence of these risk factors does not necessarily mean that you will develop prostate cancer. And uh, by far, the commonest risk factors, Dr. Kimani has alluded to, is growing old, you know? If, if you take 100 men and do post-mortems on them at the age of 80, as he said correctly, <laughs> more than 80% of them will have prostate cancer that they never knew they had. So growing old is a risk factor. Having a positive family history, if your grandfather, father, uncle has prostate cancer, and there are some cancers that tend to lump together. So breast cancer also in, in the family, you know, endometrial cancer in the family, they all sometimes share the same genetics and therefore the, the risk might be, might be higher. You know, we are talking about um, being overweight and obese also contributing slightly towards the development of prostate cancer. So those are by far some of the main risk factors of prostate cancer. But remember, sometimes you have none. You have no single risk factor and yet you develop the, the prostate cancer. I don't know if... if yeah, yeah, if, if I may add, in terms of age, it's, we know that uh, cancer of the prostate is a disease of the aging male, mm -hmm. with more than 80% of the cancers occurring in patients after the age of 65. Mm -hmm. And very rare is it that you find a cancer <coughs> of the prostate in patients under the age of 40. Mm -hmm. That said, there is also the issue of uh, race. Mm -hmm. Being an African yeah. increases your chances of, one, 
being diagnosed with cancer of the prostate two times compared to the white population. And actually even the risk of death increases by two times in an African as opposed to a Caucasian. The family history, Dr. Odiambo has alluded it very well. If you have one first degree relative, meaning a brother, a father, who may have had prostate cancer, and especially after, before the age of 65, mm -hmm. then your chances double. If it's more than two, the chances could even go up to four times mm -hmm. in terms of the risk. Then <laughs> there is the issue of uh, environmental uh, impact. Remember, autopsy studies, we go to do 100 post-mortems in, say, an African, 100 Africans, 100 Japanese, 100 uh, Caucasians, the incidence of prostate cancer in, is actually the same. How comes then that this disease manifests in an African? There must be either some genetic uh, problems or there must be environmental issues. We are told that a Japanese man moving from Japan, or from Tokyo to the U.S., and staying, staying in the U.S., he only requires one generation of a stay in the U.S. for him to acquire a similar risk to a man living in the U.S., which puts environmental issues at a, at a very... Uh, critical point in the causation of, of prostate cancer. Diet is important. Mm. People talk about lack of uh, uh, sedentary lifestyles being a, a risk factor. All those things we cannot say for sure that they do, but they are certainly increase your okay. risk. Uh, you said that in the African, because of the race, I don't know if it's because of the race, they are yes. likely to die of prostate cancer. Yeah. Is it strictly race related or is it because of all these other issues that you've raised, like access to care and screening? So is it that's that, a that's or a is it the race itself? That's a very important. There is, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you take into account issues of financial abilities and everything, they certainly contribute. Because even if you're an African, you have less access to early diagnosis, less access to treatment. But even when you look stage for stage and with access, the African still does poorer than the Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can get one or two questions. How is the health-seeking behavior of men? Is it increasing uh, with regard to prostate cancer? Are they coming for their checks or something like that? That's a very important question. Prostate cancer is unique, Marcel, like you have said. And it's unique in the sense that, one, we are saying very many patients will have prostate cancer. They will die without ever knowing that they had prostate cancer. Meaning, if we now were to go looking for men with prostate cancer, there's a probability that we will pick those who had cancer that may never have harmed them in, the, in their life. And then we also may have picked that one in whom the cancer could be uh, the cause of their, of their death. Which raises the issue of should we then invite the population for mass screening? And the answer is uh, no. You cannot invite, you go to a church and tell men, please all of you come after the, after the service. Let us, let us screen you for prostate cancer. Because you must take them through these steps and you must give them these facts that if we go looking, we could get. If we get, chances are we may get that which could have killed you and we manage it, and, but we could equally get that which was innocuous. We would never have known about it. And then we subject you to the side effects of treatment for a cancer that may never have bothered you. So we advise that you, when you go to a doctor, discuss it first with your doctor before you take the test. We have very many people coming up, running to us uh, as oncologists, uh, crying, Dr. I'm dying of prostate cancer. And when you look, it's very <laughs> low-risk prostate cancer. You, mm -hmm. Some are even 1995. A 95-year-old with low-risk cancer is, has much more competing causes of death than the cancer itself. And therefore, it is a message that we want to put to the population that this should be a discussion between the patient and the doctor. It is not a discussion between the general population with their fellow general population, because those facts must be stated. Okay, thank you. Uh, in line to what you've just said, uh, you know, Kenyans being entrepreneurs, you'll find that if I go to a uh, radiation oncologist, he's likely to recommend radiation, while a uh, surgical oncologist is likely to recommend surgery for my prostate cancer. Where do we strike the balance? It's, it's about the choice of treatment when it comes to prostate cancer treatment. One, if you are treated by, if, you are, if, if, we, if we match you stage for stage, and we, and we are talking about by radiotherapy and surgery, we are comparing them in early prostate cancer where you can offer cure. If I offer you surgery, and Dr. Odiambo here offers you radiotherapy, if you look at 100 patients of each, the length of or the, the duration of the survival 
is the same. So there's no same. difference. The difference comes in terms of the side effects to the treatment. Right? So the doctor is never supposed to tell you what you should get. The doctor is supposed to tell you, uh, Mr. X, we have diagnosed you with prostate cancer this stage. What is the probability that this cancer will kill you? We discuss. Some of these patients, when we discuss them in very early stages and they are low-risk patients, we may tell you, we're not, we're not going to offer you any treatment. We are going to follow you up over time. And if the disease shows signs of progression, then we can offer you treatment. That's called deferred treatment. And that's a choice that can be made. When it comes to choosing between surgery and radiotherapy, we are supposed to give you the advantages of surgery, the disadvantages of surgery. We give you the advantages of uh, radiation, I give you the disadvantages of radiation. And you, as a patient, having been informed, make your choice. It's called informed choice. And you should never be subjected to treatment before you have seen these two specialities. Cancer of the prostate is a multidisciplinary issue. You may have things that may negate surgery in you. You may have problems that will not allow us to operate on you. You may have problems that may not allow us to give you radiation. Now, when it comes to those choices, we guide you through the process, but the final decision is made by the patient. Mm -hmm. Dr. Diambo, mm -hmm. cancer is multidisciplinary. Any comment on this? Um, cancer of the prostate has to be managed by a big team of, of doctors, and not only surgeons and oncologists. You need people from uh, physiotherapy, people from counseling, people from nursing. It's actually a very big team because it involves you know, a long process of talking to the patient. And as he's correctly said, prostate cancer is one of those cancers where it's a, it's a bilateral discussion. You, know? you, you and the patient have to sit down and agree how we are going to move forward because there are very many options of treating prostate cancer, especially if you have early prostate cancer. The options are many, and therefore what helps us to decide how to treat the patient will depend on whatever we come up with. You know, sometimes finances also comes into play. If the surgery is going to be cheaper than the radiotherapy that you're going to have for six weeks, then you might say, because I can only afford surgery, let me go, you know, this way. So. It's, it's, not, it's never a one-man show, and we always urge you know, the patients and the public to always uh, seek different opinions, you know, get different ideas from different doctors. And it's one of those cancers where the patient is actually involved in decision-making, right from screening all the way to, to treatment. Okay. We can take one more. Uh, first of all, I want to raise a concern by Dr. Odiambo saying that mostly he's exposed to cancer patients for the prostate at the very last stage of it, 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 it's a point that you have to consider as a concern to us in our society. Because we question ourselves, where are the other stages of cancer going to? Why don't they seek medical attention? And as the Dr. Kimani said that many patients, they die with prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer. It's equally another rejoinder to that point. Now here's the concern. For infertility, as we discussed it earlier on, we realize that for infertility, we can raise a social concern to the general population. Why is it not so for prostate cancer? And Dr. Kimani did make that clear. Number two, we had issues, uh, specific issues that caused infertility as opposed to prostate cancer, which majorly deals with lifestyle and other things. Nowadays, we have theories of use of phones and tight clothing, like the radiations from our laptops, that if we expose them to ourselves, especially the men, we are at risk of prostate cancer without no clear definition of what really causes this. And then number three, this is to the medical profession as well, that many procedures that are involved in diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer, they are really not clear. For instance, look at the PSA test, the prostate-specific antigen, and the digital rectal examinations, the DREs. We, we, we have a look that a majority or the population of major people who've been subjected to that, into that process, they will honestly tell you that many of them have underwent that process and there wasn't any signs of cancer got in them. So all that were just unnecessary expenses or anything. And then still the use of NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Mm -hmm. These are drugs that people have still controversies, whether they are resulting factors that cause prostate cancer or not. So I, I think that with the presence of our doctors here, we need to make a clear clarification and borderlines on what prostate cancer is, its causes, and major ways we can use to like, make people aware and have a way to address this, so that we, we can not be in a fix that many people die with prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer. What can we do about this? 
that will form a segue to our break, and after the break, we'll answer uh, his questions and his comments that I've noted down here. We'll take a quick break, quick commercial break, and after we come back, we'll continue this discussion on cancer of the prostate as it affects men. Prostate cancer only affects old men. Myth. A majority of men with prostate cancer are over 50 years old, and a significant number is over the age of 65. However, there are cases of prostate cancer in younger men in their 20s and 30s, some of which are very aggressive. Welcome back to Health Digest, where we are discussing cancer of the prostate as it affects a majority of men in their late years. And in this discussion, we are with Dr. David Kimani, who is a urologist, and Dr. Andrew Odiambo, who is a medical oncologist. And before the break, we had um, a medical student from the University of Nairobi really asking questions about uh, getting uh, clear-cut, you know, clear-cut causes and issues around prostate cancer, including even some of the invasive and non-invasive tests that happen uh, in the medical fraternity. And I'd like to get uh, your comments, both of you, very quick comments on whereas questions. Whereas ask very many questions. And uh, if I focus on one, I focus on the issue of the etiology or the causes of prostate cancer. One is that we don't have a definitive cause of prostate cancer. In terms of etiology, what is known, age is a risk factor, family history is a risk factor, and the race is a risk factor. Those are a given. All these others are associations. Life, lifestyle adjustments, issues of diet, issues of uh, <coughs> a lot of nyamachoma, yeah? <laughs> issues of less vegetables increase the risk of prostate cancer. We know them. However, there are very many other risk factors that are at the study. And you cannot bar people from doing research because people have to research. And every time people research, they print or they publish. And then the public consumes the publication without looking at the meta-analysis. What you found, what I found, what you found when you are studying the same subject, you may found, have found a very profound relationship. I may have done the same, found no relationship. He found maybe there is a relationship. Until we do what are called meta-analysis, it's very difficult for you to say with confidence that this is a risk factor or is not a risk factor. But the ones I've alluded to are definitely known to be risk factors. When it comes to the testing that is done, uh, one, that's why I said the issue of prostate cancer should be very uh, held, uh, discussed very, very clearly with the patient. A patient should not rush to the laboratory and then comes carrying a report which he does not know what's going to happen next. By the time a patient goes to the lab, he must have been told, one, which lab to go. Because there are very many people who are doing uh, uh, these tests. We know about a lot of quacks in this, in this society. You do a, a, a PSA test, which you know is a quantitative test. It has numbers zero to maybe 10,000, 3,000. And then a laboratory report is positive or negative, like a pregnancy test. So even as I send you to a laboratory, I must know which laboratory am I sending you to. Number two, I must discuss with you what are the possible outcomes of that test before you even go for the test. That uh, you have a test, when the test comes to this value, this is the interpretation. When it comes to this value, this is the interpretation. Because even the PSA that you have correctly alluded to is a test that we do. But we know up to 19% of patients may actually have a cancer, but the PSA is normal. Majority of patients have a high PSA, but they don't have a, have a cancer. So we must have discussed with the patients the downstream effects of this test. That once I do this test, chances are I may ask for another test, or I may not ask for another test. I may be right to what percentage, I may be wrong to what percentage. Such that then when you are bringing the report, even for you it's very clear what should be the next step. So rather than have patients coming uh, crying, my PSA was very high we should have discussed with you that that was a probability even before you went for the test. 
uh, Dr. Odembo, he mentioned that, and we had said, and you said that uh, people come at late stages, or by the time you're getting, they're getting to it at the late stage. Does this say anything about the health-seeking behavior of men? Are men likely to not seek the help of a doctor as opposed to women? When it comes to health-seeking behavior, it is thought that generally men have a poor health-seeking behavior, which I might say is partly true. However, uh, many times patients go to hospital and then they are either diagnosed with the wrong condition or the doctor or the clinician who sees them thinks that they have one disease when they could be having another, which is quite common in many health uh, you know, systems all around the world. It is up to us, the medical people and the people who work in hospitals, to be able to detect patients who keep coming to hospital with the same symptoms over time and get them to be referred early to see the specialist early. But you'd find that patients would come maybe to one hospital, they are told they have a urine tract infection and then they don't get better. After three weeks, they decide, I don't like that hospital, let me go to a different one. They go and see a completely different doctor who again treats them for the same urine tract infection until they've jumped to six different hospitals. The cancer is still growing and then they end up in front of our desks with very big tumors and we have very little ways we can help them. It would be my wish that patients can be referred early and if health systems were integrated, if they were all computerized, you know, the system can detect so-and-so has been here, this is the fourth time mm -hmm. and they have the same problems. Can we, you know, refer them very early to see Dr. Kimani, you know, for surgery? So it, 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 it takes a lot of fixing of the entire health model and especially for for cancers, it's not only prostate cancer, for many other cancers of the stomach, colon, breast, whatever it is, the referral system needs to be very clear, such that if somebody comes to hospital and they have one, two, three, four, then this should ring a bell that they could possibly have cancer, and then somebody more specialized should be able to see them and refer them to the next level of care. But in the situation as it is, where, where there's not adequate training for the very low level hospitals. Patients keep going, not that, it's not that they are not seeking health, they are actually seeking health care, but they are not getting the correct answers from all those visits. And therefore we end up blaming patients that they come late. They actually don't come late. They have been going to hospital many times, but they've not been getting either the correct answer or the correct care that, that so they deserve. In, it's a situation where the system is not really responding to their exactly, needs and exactly, yeah. we, are not, we are missing the diagnosis. We have a very young man who are diagnosed with an enlarged prostate gland. What probability is there that uh, this could later lead to prostate cancer in later years of life? And I think that's a good question and it would be good to clarify, well, between uh, prostate enlargement and prostate cancer? All men have a prostate. After the age of 40, our prostate starts increasing in size. The rate at which it increases is different from one person to the other one. Just, I always tell my patient, it's like you'd have me and, and Dr. Odiabo go to a, a barber shop and we have our hairs uh, shaved. After a month, his is a little bit taller, mine is a bit shorter. So given time, the prostate <coughs> increases over time. And that increase is what we call benign prostate enlargement. And it gives symptoms of obstruction or sometimes it does not give symptoms at all. In fact, some patients have a very small prostate but it's very problematic. You have another patient with 108 grams prostate but very problematic. It depends on the point of enlargement. But benign prostate enlargement does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. So when you come with urinary symptoms, it is now the duty of the doctor to distinguish, is this, yes, these, these symptoms are coming from the prostate. Is it a prostate infection, which is called prostatitis? Is it a benign enlargement, which is age-related changes? Or is it cancer of the prostate? Because the treatment pathways are entirely different. My question is uh, on the fight against prostate cancer. We've seen a very focused and target, targeted uh, approach to the CA cervix, CA breast among women, encouraging women above 40 to have mammography, but then we are seeing too little being done on the prostate uh, cancer in men. Is it a myth that it is a, a cancer of the old age that we are getting at a late stage, but it seems to be occurring way much early? Okay, cancers in women are slightly more emotional, and that's why they get a lot of attention, you know, on TV, 
on personal <laughs> blogs, on websites. It's the truth. And if, if today you, you say, come, we're having a breast cancer run, you'll have 10,000 people. But you come and say we're having a prostate cancer run, you'll have 30 people. <laughs> Last year we had a, a cancer support group at our center and we invited everyone and only two men came and there were, you know, 35, you know, women. So those dynamics also come into play. But you've raised a very important issue. Who should be screened? When should they be screened? And how should we as a country go about it? So the first step in screening for prostate cancer is, is the patient informed, well informed or not? And it's the same model that's being used even in the United Kingdom. So if a patient is not informed at all, if the patient doesn't even know what is prostate cancer and what it can do to them, then you have no business screening that person. You are likely to cause him more damage or more harm by giving him screening and he's uninformed. Okay? Regardless of whether there's family history or not, patients have to understand the benefits and risks of, of screening. And then now it divides patients into different categories, into different age groups. So, so what I'd say in summary, if you're a man in Kenya today and you're above the age of 45, maybe 50, present yourself to the hospital and say, I would like to be informed about prostate cancer screening. And then somebody will sit down with you and explain to you this risks, benefits, and then you proceed with the test and then you carry on and so on and so forth. So if we screen and then we find that somebody has prostate cancer, what next? What, is, what would be the benefit of just doing screening if the system will not really respond to taking care of this person? And not just the treatment from the uh, professional side, but also the cost, because there's a huge cost implication. Mm -hmm. And we know that healthcare in Kenya is, does not come cheap. So after we screen, then you have found prostate cancer. Then what? Two issues that I want to, to, to bring up. That cancer of the prostate is very different from cancer of the cervix or cancer of the blood. Of, 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 the, of the cervix. If you get cancer of the cervix, it you indefinitely progress. Mm -hmm. Same thing with breast cancer, and therefore it must be treated. Mm -hmm. But you're saying prostate cancer is a very heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means it behaves differently in different people. Mm -hmm. There's a patient who's going to get cancer of the prostate that is very slow growing. Mm -hmm. He will live his life to his fullest, and that cancer will never bother him. On the other hand, there's a patient who will get a very aggressive cancer that once it's diagnosed, it will move from stage to stage and has the potential to kill him. Now, if we go to the screening and we are going to look for this cancer in the population, chances are we are going to get the two types of patients. We are going to pick those that in whom the cancer was slow growing and that in whom the cancer was, was uh, rapidly growing. So once we have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, and how do you make the diagnosis? Because I think it's important that we, we raise it to the population. Once we have a, a, a high PSA, and then an abnormal digital rectal examination, either of them can trigger a biopsy. PSA, usually when you have a one high PSA, we ask you to do a confirmatory test. Because remember, everything will fall will be premised on the, out, uh, on, the, on, the, on the findings of the PSA. So once we have done our repeat PSA and is still high, we have done a, 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 a rectal examination and probably there is an abnormality, we send you for a biopsy. Once a biopsy is done, it then it is a pathologist who says this is cancer. So unless there is a biopsy specimen, then we cannot talk about your PSA may be high. Remember, PSA will be elevated in a very patient, a very big prostate. PSA will be elevated in, uh, in, in infections of the prostate. It will be elevated after sexual contact. It can be elevated after digital rectal examination. So there are many things that could elevate a PSA. So once we have excluded those and we have found out the PSA is high, without these other reasons, then we subject you to the biopsy. Then once we have done the biopsy, two things happen. The pathologist is able not only to tell us this is cancer of the prostate, mm -hmm. but importantly, to grade it. We have what we call low-grade, intermediate-grade, and high-grade cancers, and the pathologist is able to do that. We also look at the size of the, pro the cancer itself. We may send, uh, send you to do, a, for example, an MRI. What is the size of your cancer? And then we look at the PSA. Using the PSA, the size of the, of, of the cancer itself and the, the, the pathologist report, we are able to categorize our patients into various categories. Very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, and very, very high, high risk. risk. What is not in doubt, if your disease is very low risk, we do not offer you curative treatment. We tell you, go home, see us after a year. We are going to repeat and see if there's no progression. And we know many patients will live without a problem 
being observed, yet they had a cancer. Now, the issue comes in with the high risk and the very high risk. Those ones must be treated because if you don't treat them, then there is an issue of they can die from the cancer. And then there is those patients who have what is called intermediate risk. Intermediate means you can either go this side or this go this side. side. It means probably that we must do more frequent uh, reviews for you. And if you fall on this side, we treat you. If you fall on the other side, we keep on following you. So there is that what is called risk stratification, which now governs as to whether we treat you or we don't treat you. From the earlier story that we'd had, I uh, was saying early screening, early detection. I don't know if you have anything else to add uh, just to close this conversation. Just a reminder that prostate cancer is not the killer that we know it is. Like we have said, many patients will die with their cancer, not of their cancer. And if you go to your doctor, you can have a discussion and know whether you, 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 you should be uh, subjected to biopsy or not. Depending on the biopsy, you may be treated or you may be followed up. What is important is that services for PSA screening are available in all level three hospitals onwards. As long as there is a doctor in your, in your facility and there is a PSA test, he can give you the information, he can do the PSA, and once the PSA is abnormal, the primary doctor will not treat you beyond that. He's going to guide you to see a urologist who is going to guide your further management. What I would urge is uh, more input from our government as far as they have done well as far as the diagnosis is concerned but supposing with all this exposure everybody goes gets informed by by by, by the doctors that you and they agree you're going to have a test then we end up so many patients who require treatment as a country are we able to offer that treatment because that should be the next uh, concern we may all take up the challenge we go have a discussion be informed get tested and a significant chunk of the patients requires treatment because they have intermediate or high-risk disease. And when you now come to treatment, how many of them are going to offer uh, to, to, to afford the radical prostatectomy that is done? How many can afford the radical radiotherapy that can be done? If the answer is no, then it negates why you are screening in the first place, mm -hmm. which now brings us to the issue. The government has done...